Anybody else want to preach on that today? <laughs> That's just part of the chapter. I was telling my wife this week, I said, this is hard. It's a very, very hard chapter to understand and then a very hard chapter to preach. And some of you have come up to me this morning and you have not acknowledged as much. But I truly believe it's this chapter right here is essential if we're trying to understand how we change and continue to grow as believers in Christ. So let's pray and ask the Lord to do something significant this morning. Lord, we ask that through this chapter, which is difficult, but it also describes our reality, describes our struggle, describes our rescue in Jesus. And it ends about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. So, Lord, do something significant this morning in our hearts through your word, by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. A common experience for all of us is that we can set out to do something good and then not do it. That which we want to do, we don't do. And that which we don't want to do, we do. We can all relate to that human struggle, even that struggle as a believer, where we have uh, intentions on doing good, especially with relation to another, and then we sin and we don't do it. Or we're struggling with something personally, some temptations that continue to creep up on us, and we think, okay, I got this, and then we dive in once again. That which we want to do, we don't do, right? Right? All of us can experience this. All of us, this is our reality. Someone said it's like playing the game of golf. Very similar to golf in that anybody here play golf and you think, okay, what I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, I do, right? But we're talking about our relationship with the Lord and we're going, okay, is, is this going to be with us until the day we die? Does this mean that we were going to continue to dive into the same sins over and over again? Does this mean that I'm going to live a defeated Christian life? What does it mean that there's still some presence of sin hanging around, creeping up on me where I'm doing what I don't want to do? What does that mean? And that's what we're going to see this morning as we turn to Romans 7. Romans chapter 7. We've been building a case for the last several weeks on do people change? Do you change? Do I change? Do we become Christians and we still live the same way we did before we were Christians? What does it mean that we actually change? Do people really change? And on, and on, on some good days, I say, yes, people change. And on some bad pastoral days, I say, no, they don't. It can be frustrating in my own life and it can be frustrating in your life. So we've been building this case for Christ-like change. Kind of want to give you a quick review of where we've been uh, over the last several weeks. So we said several weeks ago, expect to change. Confess your sin. Receive rescue in the gospel. We said embrace your death and resurrection in union with Christ, Romans 6. Exercise your freedom. Become who you are, Romans 6. And last week we talked about strategize for righteousness. And this morning, we're going to talk about that we need to acknowledge the struggle, that there is still a struggle going on inside of us. And now, let me tell you this. If you're a believer and you don't acknowledge a struggle in your life or you want to cover it up, then I want to tell you, don't, don't come to church hiding your stuff. Because I'm going to tell you this. This church, and I want this to be a safe place where we can confess sin to one another and grow. Let this be a safe place where we can talk about things. Yes, we can be embarrassed. We can be ashamed of it. But let's talk about it and not be pounced on and kicked out. Let's grow in Christ. And part of that is acknowledging that we all still struggle. Yes, you do. Yes, I do. That person next to you. Yes, every single person. We still struggle with sin because we're not with Jesus yet. And we have to acknowledge that. And we come to Romans 7. It talks about this struggle. 
Now, look, there are people that have studied uh, Romans 7 for a long time, and there's different viewpoints out there. Some of you may have these different viewpoints. One, one interpretation says that, that Paul is not describing his personal struggle, but it's the nation of Israel. Or, or some believe that he is expressing the reality of Adam and all humanity. And others think this is Paul describing his pre-conversion uh, struggle. But I just want to say this morning that I, I believe, and what I, I think this is teaching is this, Paul is describing himself as a non-believer and as a believer. And his current struggle mimics the reality of us all. And that's what we're going to dive into this morning. But in order to get there, it's going to be tough. And so I want to kind of lay out where we're going in this context of the Old Testament law. I'm going to kind of give you where we're going. So we're going to talk about, on the first point, the Christian is dead to the law spouse and has married Christ. That's 7, 1 through 6. Then we're going to say the law is not bad, but sin abuses it, 7 through 12. And then sin's attempts to abuse continues, even in the Christian. And then we're going to talk about the great rescue in Jesus. I hope you're ready. Let's study deep. Let's go. Romans 7, verse 1. Or do you not know, brethren, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? Paul has been describing justification, growth, and grace. But it's been touching on the law. And some of the Jews would say, hey, Paul, excuse me, can I ask you a question? Uh, what about the Old Testament law? And Paul's like, oh, let me tell you about the law. You see, the law is valid upon a person as long as he's still alive. We would agree. The laws in the United States of America are valid upon you while you're alive. Once you're dead, you're free from the law. Now, he moves from this common sense illustration concerning the law to marriage. Look at verse 2. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband... While he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Makes sense. A woman is bound to her husband by law unless he dies. Then she can marry another man. And Paul is talking like this because a death has occurred. He's not trying to talk about marriage. He's trying to say, look, here's an illustration in marriage that when a spouse dies, the other one's free to marry. And he's saying in relation to the Old Testament law, you can think about the Ten Commandments, a death has occurred. All right? That's what he's getting at. A death has occurred. But it's not the death of the law, but it's your death. Look at verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also are made to die to the law through the body of Christ so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. No longer is the Christian believer under the condemning effects of the law because they have died. The believer has been crucified, buried, and raised with Christ, which means that we are no longer looking at the Old Testament in order to justify ourselves to get in good with God to go to heaven. No, we can't do that. So we trust in Jesus, forgive us from our sins. And in a sense, we, it says that we are joined with Christ, dead, buried, and resurrected. Now get this. If you're still trying to keep the law for your salvation, it's just not going to work. And so our relationship to the law is not one for justification, which means we don't try to be good to go to heaven. We trust one who is good in our place, Jesus. And when we trusted him, our relationship to the Old Testament as in with regard to the commandments of God, we'll get to this, is that we died. We've been buried. We've been resurrected. And now, as we are believers, there's been this change in us. Now now look at verse 5 and 6. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law, We're at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we've been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. All right? So right now we're not trying to seek our salvation by obeying the Ten Commandments and earn our salvation. That's impossible. We're not going in that direction. We are those who've died, buried, raised with Christ. We're now controlled by the spirit. And we now walk by the spirit. So in a sense, we are dead to the law. And this, I know this is very complicated to understand, so, and I, I cannot think of a, ways to explain this, and I've been trying. So the, the best way I can try to explain this to you has to do with uh, something that happened to me uh, a, a few years ago when I, I bought this humongous sectional 
couch at Costco. Uh, it took me like two or three loads to get it home in our minivan, spent a lot of money for it, and I, and I thought, man, this is the this is the best sectional because I got, you know, got a lot of kids. I'm like, okay, we can all spread out on, on this sectional. But I'll tell you what, I thought that sectional would bring me a lot of happiness. But what started to happen over time is as spring started to come through with the fabric, the fabric started to tear. Now, it could have something to do with us having so many people on it and my kids jumping on it and everything. It could be that. And then the fabric started to get holes in it. And it could be because there was a mouse living in there and there was food and there was junk. Oh, and so this sectional, I thought, this is, this is, this is, I'm, I'm indebted to the section. I paid a lot of money for it. It's going to make me happy. And now every time I saw that sectional, I said, oh, that makes me so mad. It's just, it represents our life. We're just a mess. There's holes all in it. And so the sectional I thought would bring me happiness, it, it, every, I'd walk down to the basement and see it, and I'd just be like, oh, I'm, I'm miserable. But then I came up with an idea. I always come up with ideas, don't I? I came up with an idea, and I said, you know, I bought this from Costco, and I heard that Costco has a very generous return policy. <laughs> right? I mean, I think it was like, if you return something within two years, they'll, no questions asked, they'll just return it for you. I thought, it's, and I, and I told my wife, she's like, you're crazy. There's no way they're going to take that junk back. So I, I loaded it up. You know, I had to make a few trips. I loaded it up, and I'm, I'm standing in the line of returns. So I got this 20 pieces of sectional. I'm like, I'm here returning my sectional. Holes in it, junk out. And, you know, they returned it. They took it back. And when I walked out of there, I said to the sectional, you were dead to me. <laughs> I didn't really say that. I didn't really say that. But that's, that's the idea, right? It's like what, what Paul and the argument that he's trying to make now is like this, this law, there's nothing wrong with the law. It's what the law does to me. I abuse the law. It reveals sin in me. And so rather than the law that's going to make me happy, it's, it's, it's not bad, right? But there's some abuse going on inside of me that it's a picture like the sexual is a picture of our life and how a mess it once was. But get this. Paul's like, but I'm not done with the law. It's just like me. I, I'm not done sitting on couches, right? There's still some importance of the law in the believer's life, but we have a different relationship with the law because we have died, buried, and raised with Christ. Well, let's continue to understand this, all right? The law is not bad, but sin abuses it. Verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law, for I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Oh, this is good. It said the law is not the problem, but sin is the problem. It's like sin hijacks the law and leads to all types of sinning. So the law is good, exposes sin for what it is. And let's take coveting for example. Paul couldn't put his finger on the sin of coveting. He did it, but he's like, oh, what is it? What is it? And, and then the commandment told him not to covet. And once the commandment said, don't, don't covet, it, it was all downhill from there because the law exposed the sin in us. That was always there, but there is nothing wrong with the law, but sin abuses it. Verse 8, but sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind for apart from the law, sin is dead. So it's not like sin is not existence without the law, but the law exposes sin, stirs it up. And Paul is reflecting on this experience he had as a, as a non-Christian, which is true for all of us. And then he continues in verse 9. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. Paul thought he was doing pretty good as a moral man, but the law exposed all types of sin in him. It, it, this is what happens was we think, you ask people, yes, most people in America, how do you know you're going to heaven one day? And most of them will say, be a good person. But when you talk to that supposedly good person, Give them the law and see what it does. Talk to them about the Ten Commandments and see what it does. 
when we were living in Santa Monica, California, I would go out with, with my church friends, and we would set up something called a Jesus booth, all right, where they could come up and ask questions, whatever they want, about Jesus. We were on this very crowded promenade down there, if you're in a Third Street promenade, and people would come up, and they'd ask questions. We'd ask them questions, and we would always talk. Every single night we went out, we would have this discussion with someone. Um, how do you know you're going to heaven? They'll say, I'm a good person. And I say, are you sure you're a good person? They said, absolutely. I said, well, let me just walk you through some of the Ten Commandments and, and see how that holds up. Have you ever coveted? Oh, yes. You ever lied? Sure. Have you ever committed adultery? No, I've never committed adultery. Have you ever lost it? Oh, okay, I've lost it. So you kind of on and on and on and on it goes, and you'll find out they're, they're a liar, they're adulterous, they're coveting, they're sinful. And that's what the law does. It exposes our sin, where before a holy God, no one is good. But is the law the problem? Is the Ten Commandments the problem? Is the problem out there? No, no. The problem is in here with our hearts. Verse 12. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. There's nothing wrong with the law, but the law cannot save you because sin in you continues to abuse the law. So get this, there is no self-salvation. There's no one who could be good enough to go to heaven. No salvation because no one keeps the law, the Ten Commandments, all the other laws perfectly. The law is meant to expose our sin and draw us to Jesus. And this is true in a different way for the believer. Let's continue on as we're going to look at sin's attempt to abuse, even in the Christian. Verse 13, look at verse 13. Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? Hmm, it might never be. Rather, it was sin, in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good, so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. The law did not bring me separation from God, but your sin is what brought you separation from God. The law just exposed your sin for the evil that it really is. So the law is not the problem, the heart is the problem. And even as a Christian, we can feel this struggle. As Paul says in verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold in bondage to sin, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For I'm not practicing what I would like to do. But I'm doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law. Confessing the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Now, Paul's not saying these things to explain away his sin or show how he is not responsible. So I want to encourage you, don't use Romans 7 to justify and affirm your, your sin, but use Romans 7 to acknowledge the struggle. Paul is acknowledging the struggle and showing how he feels helpless and powerless. So not only does the law expose sin in the unbeliever's life, but it continues to expose sin in our life because we're not in heaven and until we're in heaven, we're going to have this ongoing struggle where we can say, okay, I agree that the law, I agree the word of God, the commands even in the New Testament, the commands from Jesus, I agree that they are good, but I am, I'm not perfect, and I find myself still doing what I don't want to do. You know, there was a few years ago that I had some eye irritation, there was Redness in my eyes. I didn't know what was going on. So I went to the bathroom, and I got uh, the eye drops, and I put them in, and I started screaming my head off. And then I looked at the bottle, and I just put ear drops in my eyes. Anybody else ever do that? Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. I mean, how can, how can we be so stupid, right? Why would we do that? And then two or three years later, I had some more eye irritation. I went to the bathroom, got some drops, put in my eyes, screamed again. No joke, eardrops in the eye. Anybody ever do it twice? <laughs> exactly, right? Like, what are you doing? That's what it's like 
with sin. You're like, I can't believe you did that. I can't believe you did it again. Oh, you did, you did it again. I cannot believe that. Yeah, that's the ongoing struggle that we have with sin. It's like, I can't believe I keep doing that. And then Paul continues, and he wants us to push through the struggle. Verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For good that I want to do, I don't do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I'm doing the very thing I do not want, I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Paul's describing this event toward the flesh or indwelling sin or, or nothing good dwells in me or, or law waging war. You're like, what is it in part of us that causes us to do this sin? Because we're still in the flesh. We're still in the body. We, remember we talked about the, the zombie flesh in you is still alive, right? You've been crucified like, you know, you think about uh, a person's been killed and then they get up and they start walking around. There's this zombie flesh still hanging around. There's still something going on in me in this flesh, in this world where I have this bent towards sin. You can think of, of people who have who've conquered smoking. Some of them may still feel this pull toward smoking or p- people that go to AA may still feel the pull toward alcohol. Now, now, now think of it as we are believers, we're all addicted to sin. There's still something in us that, that is pulling us toward sin. And left to ourselves, we will give in every single time. Look at the struggle as it continues. Verse 21. By the way, this is Paul talking, and Paul knows the law better than any of us, right? Paul knows the word. Paul, Paul know, Paul's an apostle, and he is saying about his struggle. Verse 21, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? Paul's saying, hey, I feel wretched. Anybody ever feel wretched? Oh, yeah, chief of sinners. Feel like, yeah, I feel chief, chief of sinners. The law is exposing sin still in the life of the believer. But I want you to know this this is not the complete story. You know, Romans 7 is not the end where you can say, okay, I guess Romans 7, I'm going to continue to struggle and give into the sin uh, every single time. And and I want to say, look, all right, look. Romans 7 is the normal Christian life, but it's not the normal Christian life. You know what I'm saying? So, Yes, it is something we acknowledge. All of us struggle in this pull towards sin, but it is not the normal Christian life to say, I struggle, I'm going to do it again. That is not the normal Christian life. Yes, it's normal to struggle, but as believers, we do not say we are destined to always give in to sin over and over again because Paul asked the question, who will rescue me from this body of death. And we have the answer. Jesus, verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. Yeah, there's, there's this ongoing struggle. My mind wants to go one direction of obedience and the flesh wants to take us another, but there is victory, victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I want you to hear this. So not, not only will there be future deliverance in heaven when we are free from the presence of sin, but there is present day freedom from the power of sin. I want to say it again. I'll make sure you get that. Okay. So not only there's going to be this future deliverance in heaven when we're free from the presence of sin, but there is present day freedom from the power of sin. You say, well, why do I still struggle? Because sin is still present. But get this, because you have died, buried, raised again, you now have power. Sin and Satan no longer have power over you. You, know, you get that. Do you believe that? You do not have to give in. You do not have to follow. See, some of us, it's, it's really hard because some of us don't want to acknowledge a struggle because how many of you say, 
Man, I want to live in Romans 6, and I want to live in Romans 8. I don't want to have nothing to do with Romans 7. I want to be Romans 6. Yeah, I've been crucified and raised in victorious Christian living. Romans 8, we're more than conquerors. Yes, let's go. Romans 7, can we just cut that out of the Bible? But the struggle is still there because we still deal with the presence of sin. But sin no longer has power over us. And it's not because we're self-saviors, we have power in and of ourselves, or we're just great law keepers. Now, the answer is, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So for those of you who came here this morning struggling, I'd like to welcome you. We are all fellow strugglers. And can I give you some encouragement? If you're struggling with sin and it bothers you, praise God. You're a believer. If you're not bothered by your sin, I would be bothered by you. Because believers truly are bothered by sin. We realize we, we don't want to create accountability of groups of guys and girls where they just go around the circle and all talk about their sin the whole time, okay? Because we don't want to stop there. We can be in accountability, we can confess sin, but don't stop there. Move on to the glorious news. Who can rescue you from this body of death? Jesus. Jesus. And notice that it's a who and not a how. You may go to counseling. You may come see the pastor. You may deal with a lot of things. And you say, how can I overcome this? And you know the answers. You know getting in the word. You know community. You know prayer. And you say, okay, I know the how, but it's pointing to the who. Who can rescue you? Just as if there's no self-salvation, there's no self-sanctification, right? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And some of you have such a, a pull on you from this certain sin in your life. I, and and I, it's, I know we're a big crowd today. You don't want to get into things that are, are embarrassing, that struggles in your life. But, I mean, there are some of you that have such a, uh, you're so caught up in something right now. And you don't feel like there's any way out. And, and some of you, you know, I mean, you, some of you, it's straight up pornography. You real, you're just into that. And you, you hate it. You're convicted of it, you're never going to do it, and then you go again. And you say, well, well, how can I get over this, or I'm just destined to be a part of that? For no, you're not. There is victory in Jesus. You go, well, how? And I want to talk to you about who. Yes, you know all the hows. Okay, I'm going to put a filter on this. i got to just not do that. i got to be an account. You know all the hows. But it's about coming back in the midst of all the hows to who? Do you truly believe Jesus can rescue you? And for those of you who have other issues, you're thinking, there's no way I'm ever going to stop doing that. I'm just going to be known as that irritable person, <laughs> right? Or I'm just going to be known as that greedy person. I know what's in my heart. You think, oh, boy, I'm, I'm destined to go again. Pastor, how do I stop being so greedy? What should I do? It's not about how. It's about who. And I, I can tell some of you when you talk about your struggles, you have no, you're not ashamed to talk about Jesus. That Jesus is the one who's going to help you, is the one who's going to rescue you. But some of us in our struggles, we talk kind of broadly about the Bible and, and kind of broadly about God. But, but do you really know Jesus? Is he the one that truly has saved you from your sins? Is he the one that's truly going to sanctify you now in the presence and make you more like him? Because I don't know where all of you are coming from and what you're all dealing with, but I do know this. Jesus is the who. Jesus is the one that will give you victory even in your struggle. Jesus is the one. Of course, would you believe he's going to save you from your sins and the wrath of God? Of course I believe that. Do you believe he can give you victory over sin? I'm not so sure about that one. The same Jesus who saves is the same Jesus who sanctifies. And we can talk about the how all day long, but we got to come back to who. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray.
Lord, we just want to acknowledge what is going on inside of us. And that's not always what we want to be having going on inside of us. Some of us feel stuck. Some of us feel that we're in bondage. That we're going to keep doing the same old thing that we've been doing for decades. Help us to acknowledge the struggle. Help us to acknowledge stuff that's going on inside of us, but help us not to stay there in the struggle, but to turn to Jesus, a relationship with Jesus. And Lord, maybe there's someone here that just flat out don't know you. They've gone to church, they talk about God and talk about the Bible in broad terms, but they don't know you. Will you draw them to you this morning in repentance and faith in Jesus, like right now, or draw them to you? If that's you this morning, just in your head, in your mind, in your heart, just confess and find forgiveness in Jesus. Tell them tell you trust him. You're not going to try to save yourself. You're not going to try to be good. You know you're not good. Trust Jesus right now. And for those of you who are struggling, you feel like there is no change. You don't see any change. Talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord Jesus. Say, Jesus, help me. Rescue me. Change me. Rearrange my thoughts. Draw me to you. Lord, without you, we would be hopeless. But we are thankful. Thanks be to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.